How does one begin to describe graduate school? Let's investigate. Well, that's it, folks. 7 out of 10 internet experts agree grad school is a difficult and unpleasant waste of time. Two of them were probably lying, and I think the last one is just lost. Really, though, for all the supposed career gains to be made from finishing over 15 years of school and then being like, yeah, I think I'll do more of that, going to grad school is low-key known as a kind of masochistic thing to do. You spend two to eight years making poverty wages to get a degree that, depending on your field, may or may not actually lead to a job after graduation. Exploitation and discrimination are wildly common and often damn near impossible to do anything about. Mental health conditions are abysmal with absurd rates of depression, anxiety, and things that I can't say on this website without getting demonetized. I think a lot of people who look into going to grad school have at least some vague awareness of all this unpleasantness, and I think they're able to functionally cancel out that fear with an often unspoken belief. I'll be the exception. Other people might have a hard time, but I'm different. I'm just gonna focus on my work. I'm not here to make friends. This is not RuPaul's best friend, no. right? Look, I don't want to sit here trying to convince people that they're not special, but I've seen a lot of people go into grad school with that attitude, and they quickly find out that they are not. So if someone really has their heart set on going to grad school, or whatever other job opportunity in which they can expect a similarly toxic work environment, how can they possibly cope with the inevitability of such psychologically damaging work conditions? I can't say I have the answer to that, but if I have any advice for you, it's this. Don't try to do it alone. <laughs> choices, this video isn't just about unions. At time of recording, the historic UC academic worker strike is ongoing and I'm very excited about it and I will be talking about it later. But in general, this video is about surviving. So I'm about a year and a half out of a PhD program that I almost dropped out of. And I don't mean almost dropped out like ideation, I was making arrangements. It was serious. <laughs> and I don't want to get into the specifics of why I had a bad time or why anybody else has a bad time, that's not what this video is about. The answers to that question question are complex, numerous, and deeply systemic, and kind of what the rest of my videos are about. But something I want to be absolutely clear about is that if you're a grad student and you're having a hard time, it's probably not your fault. The reason half of grad students are anxious or depressed is not, in fact, a matter of widespread personal failure, but because this is kind of the state of things, for the time being, that is. I want to give people who are in that situation some practical advice. And this advice is not on how to write the best papers, or how to make the most grant money, or otherwise life hack your way to success. It's about learning to rely on other people. Other people, as far as I'm concerned, is the only way to survive the absolute gauntlet that is moving through modern academia while at what is arguably the bottom of its hierarchy. My advice is based on a combination of my personal experiences, research I've conducted on the topic, and other sources I've found, scholarly or otherwise. And for what it's worth, I do think that a lot of this will apply to other toxic work environments that aren't academia. You might have to adapt things a little for your circumstances, but hopefully you can still find something useful here. I'm going to start with kind of a general theoretical framework for thinking about interdependence as a replacement for the independence that so many of us have learned to valorize, let's say. But unlike my usual content, ugh, I hate that. I want this video to be light on the critique and heavy on the what do, so I'm gonna spend most of it going through specific, concrete examples of what it is that I mean when I say the solution is other people. And I'll conclude with one example that is extra special and very topical and kind of personal and it's very exciting. <laughs> When Hurricane Katrina slammed into the Gulf Coast, almost everything lost its footing. Houses were detached from their foundations, trees and shrubbery were uprooted, signposts and vehicles floated down the rivers that became of the streets. But amidst the whipping winds and surging water, the oak tree held its ground. How? Instead of digging its roots deep and solitary into the earth, 
The oak tree grows wide and interlocks with other oak trees in the surrounding area. And you can't bring down a hundred oak trees bound beneath the soil. How do we survive the unnatural disasters of climate change, environmental injustice, over-policing, mass imprisonment, militarization, economic inequality, corporate globalization, and displacement? We must connect in the underground, my people. In this way, we shall survive. Naima Peniman. Adrienne Marie Brown is one of my all-time favorite writers, activists, and meme aggregators. Seriously, her meme roundups never miss. Her works about imagining better worlds, actually living your values, and centering joy while striving for a more just future. That quote just now about the oak trees? That was from her 2017 book Emergent Strategy, which outlines radical principles for organizing people, with enough specificity to be able to understand what it means, but enough generalization that you can apply it to basically any context with humans in it. If you're interested in any kind of organizing, I highly recommend giving the whole book a read. It's not that long and it's actually pretty fun with like poetry and cool nature facts all woven together in these moving and powerful ways. But today, I'm only concerned with one of her principles. Interdependence. Brown explains the idea of interdependence as mutual reliance. The idea that we can meet each other's needs in a variety of ways, that we can truly lean on others and they can lean on us. She contrasts this with the way that many of us have been socialized towards independence. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. An idea which, as a physicist, I take major problem with. Somebody please draw me the free body diagram that shows how you can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Why isn't it possible? It's just not. Why not, you stupid bastard? Because we live in a money-driven world where we are not guaranteed our most basic needs, we learn that competition is the way to win at life. To survive. Only the fittest survive, of course. And while no one's arguing that competition doesn't exist in nature, humans have theoretically gotten to the point where we don't need to compete anymore. For example, farmers globally produce enough food to feed one and a half times the human population, but for some reason there are people who are hungry and most of us think there are only enough resources for those that can compete the hardest. I mean, do you think these guys are still competing for survival? Survival? No. This is unequivocally ego. Competition for the sake of itself. And because a few people have accumulated egregious fractions of humanity's total wealth and want to compete over whatever this is, the rest of us think that we also need to compete to live. But in reality, just like those oak trees that survived Hurricane Katrina, we're actually a lot more resilient in collaboration with each other. Which like, is not a particularly scalding take, I know. Work together? Do I really think you haven't heard that before? But in the hyper-individualistic world that is academic research, collaboration is actually kind of transgressive. And by collaboration, I don't mean doing the minimum amount of effort that gets your name on somebody else's paper. I mean challenging the mythology of the singular genius in our very approach to interacting with others. Because let's be honest, it is mythology. At least in my field, it was absolutely bananas how aggressive the cultural messaging around the need for competition was. Textbooks that paint the history of the field as the product of individual great men. Professors who will proudly explain high failure rates as simply the byproduct of identifying those few brilliant minds. A culture passed on from institutions like Cambridge's Cavendish Laboratory, in which 19th century physics students competed in, and I quote, a test combining physical athleticism and mental agility in a demonstration of manliness. I'm not even gonna get into the men of it all today. But my point is that cutthroat survival of the fittest competition is kind of baked into the field. And even outside of physics, scientific institutions are increasingly having to contend with things like the literal bullying that happens and researchers fight to the top. Literally bullying. The thing kids do, but grown-ass scientists. And in a place like that, interdependence, real interdependence, can be the difference between making the best of a bad situation and spiraling into isolation, burnout, and or mental illness. As such, the advice I tend to give new and prospective grad students is focus on building relationships. Seek relationships, invest in relationships, lean on your relationships because no matter how much you think you can just will yourself into focusing on your work, at some point, the work is gonna suck. Or maybe it won't, I don't know. Are you willing to bet your mental wellness? And if slash when it does, you'll get through a lot more easily if you already have your people around you, especially if you've already gotten to the point where you actually know how to ask for and receive help. 
That last bit doesn't sound difficult, but for some of us, easier said than done, let's say. So without any further ado, I'm gonna go through seven kinds of relationships that I wish I had known to cultivate when I started grad school. It's not an exhaustive list, and maybe you don't need them all, but hopefully it inspires you to find opportunities for interdependence in your own life. <laughs> I don't know why I chose the most contentious point on this list to start with. Here's the disclaimer. Despite what women on Twitter say, therapy is not a cure-all silver bullet that will solve all of anyone's problems. Therapy can be extremely expensive, and even if you can afford it, a good therapist can be kind of hard to find, especially if you're of a minoritized identity and don't feel like explaining the basic facts of your existence as a preface to literally anything else. There are plenty of issues with therapy and the broader institution of psychiatry, and if you want to learn more about that, check out these videos that I have linked by Fab Socialism and Mia Mulder on those topics. But all that said, there is no way in hell I would have graduated without the help of my therapist. Therapy is by no means a solution to everything, but it's a good place to start. If this whole interdependence thing and having to build community and make friends kind of stresses you out, a therapist can help you learn communication skills, or deal with social anxiety, or perhaps excavate your inability to accept help from people. That one's also me. If you've not yet caught on to the idea that a lot of people would benefit from therapy and it doesn't necessarily mean they're damn or bad. Just think of the sheer utility of having someone whose job it is to listen to you talk about your problems who's not like a friend. You don't have to feel bad that the conversation is totally and selfishly just about you. They're definitely not going to talk about your problems to other people you know. And they even take little notes about the things you say so they can remember what you said before. They're professional listeners for hire, and if that's not a compelling reason to seek one out, I don't know what is. Okay, I'm being kind of hyperbolic, there are actually lots of reasons one might seek therapy, but you get my point, right? So if you're a person with a brain and emotions and think that therapy might be useful to you, the next question is access. Most grad programs will give you health insurance, and it may not be the best, but it might include mental health services. It also might be worth checking out your university's general mental health resources. They might have free counselors on campus or something like that. You could also look into pro bono counseling, just search online or cold call providers and ask if they offer it, it turns out that some do. A word of warning, actually getting an appointment with a therapist can be an unnecessarily arduous task and it's easy to get discouraged. It can get even more discouraging when you realize that you might not actually like the first person you see. Commit a few minutes per week to calling people, stick with it, shop around, and make sure you ask questions so you actually start off with someone that you trust. Or at least get along with. And if traditional therapy is completely out of the question for you, get creative. Maybe your therapy is a religious support group or one of those meetups where guys talk about their feelings. I don't know. The idea is just having somewhere you regularly go to work out your stuff and ideally having that place before you really need it. Because as hard as it can be to find a therapist, I promise it is harder to do when you're already in crisis. So figure that out early. And I guess for anyone who's not even ready to go out into the real world to talk to another human being about their mental health, here are two people you might check out online to at least learn more. The first one is Dr. K, a college dropout turned monk, turned psychiatrist, turned Twitch streamer who does a phenomenal job of inter integrating Eastern knowledge like yoga and Ayurveda with Western knowledge like neuroscience research and clinical experience in his extremely practical discussions of mental health that are also available on his YouTube channel and as a podcast. His content is clearly intended for the archetypal video game addicted man who lives in his parents' basement, but honestly, I listen to it all the time and I always find something useful. The second is Dr. Aisha Khan, a microbiologist slash ecologist slash abolitionist who talks about mental health through a collectivist anarchist social justice lens in her writing and podcasts. If the first Dr. K is offering individual solutions, the second Dr. K is offering collective solutions. She recently wrote this great piece on how seasonal affective disorder is just how we pathologize the fact that people get sad when they can't adapt to the changing environment in winter the way almost all life does because of our silly little jobs. They're so silly. <laughs> So 
So you might arrive at your new department all starry-eyed and meet everybody and think, these are gonna be my friends for the next however many years. And they totally can be, I'll talk more on that later, but right now, I cannot overstate how important it is that you have friends outside of work. Especially because most people go to a new city to start grad school, you're probably starting off this massively difficult multi-year endeavor with effectively no social network. And it's not like college where you're constantly making friends at events and new classes. You're probably going to be in one building, if not one room, the whole time. I promise you, you are going to want a place where you can get away from that. Being around people who aren't caught up in their ivory towers or sunk in the depths of their research is going to be a really grounding thing to have if slash when grad school gets bad. And it feels kind of trite to just say, oh, go find a community, but basically it just means join a thing. Trust me, I read lots of WikiHow articles about this. I have friends, I definitely have friends. The first thing is to find a class or a sport or a cultural organization or some kind of common interest meetup, whatever. A group of people who get together in a place. Just go somewhere regularly where other people also go regularly and try to have some conversations with people. Then when you start having conversations with people, ask them to do another thing. Grab a meal together after a workout class or continue a conversation from a book club over coffee. Literally just ask people to go to a second location with you, but like not in a murdery way. You can do that, right? Don't murder people. And then later follow up with a text or something. Again, in a non-murdery way. I'll be honest, I know how awkward and forced it can feel to try to make friends as an adult. It is notoriously difficult, not just for grad students. But it's also something you get better at with practice, and I also think it's something that people tend to appreciate. People generally like to feel that someone wants to be their friend. You're not creepy for trying to hang out with someone, that's literally just what being friendly is. If you want more awkwardly analytical information on befriending people, check out this Medium post by social psychologist Dr. Devin Price that's written by and aimed at autistic people, but honestly, there are lots of places where non-disabled people can learn a lot from disabled people, and I think this is definitely one of them. So yeah, do something where you regularly come into contact with other people and try to initiate additional interactions with those people. The community will come. Finding a place where you can socialize away from your work is going to be really valuable. Bonus points if the thing you join is active, like a running club, or a dance class, or a boxing gym, or a yoga studio. Taking care of your physical health exercise along with other things like healthy eating and sleeping does a lot to support your mental health. And I know a lot of us academics were indoors kids and gym class might not have been one of our strong suits. Trust me, I was there. But it turns out that when you can pursue whatever interests you, be it rock climbing or capoeira or badminton or roller skating, instead of just the thing they were doing in PE that day you called in sick, movement can actually be a really valuable part of your life. Who knew? Not me and my reading in the library at recess hours. <laughs> So we have our outside world network, now we need people on the inside. The people who can relate to what you're going through and understand the landscape you're navigating. If you're lucky enough to end up in a department with grad students you vibe with, great. However, if you don't, consider broadening your horizons a bit. Make friends with undergrads, postdocs, staff. There can kind of be a norm of only socializing with people inside your academic class, but honestly, if it means finding people you genuinely connect with in your workplace, I don't think it's a norm worth investing in. It can also be easy to get caught up in your own department and not realize that there are campus-wide organizations, graduate or otherwise, that can enable you to feel more connection with the broader community. Just find anyone you vibe with and follow the earlier steps about befriending people. Short of IRL friends at your own institution, there's a growing number of digital communities for academics online. For example, there are affinity-based Twitter communities like Black and Astro, or professional societies like SACNIS. Obviously, I'm only giving astronomy examples because that's what I know, but like, do some Googling. Be a researcher. To be transparent, I really don't use social media, she says on her YouTube channel, so I personally don't have much experience with digital communities like this, but I definitely know lots of people who have found Discord servers or group chats of academics they met at conferences or online that ended up being an invaluable part of their support networks. One way or another, find friends that you share some aspect of your experience as a grad student with. The crucial thing is that you have friends on the inside, which ends up being pretty important for maintaining a sense of connection to your work. Friends.
building off that last point, making friends in your field is a great starting point for finding collaborators. Like I said earlier, we tend to idolize the lone scientist who is the sole author on all his papers. His papers. His. But I think it's usually more productive and more enjoyable to collaborate with people, especially if you actually like them. I think grad students often start with the assumption that they can only work with somebody who works on something that's exactly what they work on, but at least in my experience, my best collaborations have come out of people that I clicked with on a human level first, regardless of what kind of research they did. If we vibed as people, it kind of didn't matter what we worked on because the work was going to get done and be enjoyable regardless. For me, the amount I cared about the subject matter versus the amount I cared about the values of the person completely switched between starting grad school and graduating. You can talk to people at conferences, you can reach out to the author of an interesting paper you read, you could even ask your colleagues to connect you with their colleagues who they think you'd get along with. It's apparently called networking. It would be really cool if there were more opportunities to do that professionally that didn't center on alcohol, but I digress. Finding collaborators is basically just making friends with a work goal attached. And I think collaborator doesn't even have to be someone you're working on a project with. It could just be someone you enjoy the company of. Sometimes me and my colleagues get together to work over Zoom without even doing anything together. We just share our goals at the beginning and like ask for feedback if we need it during and at the end kind of recap and congratulate ourselves for having actually done something today. Or I have friends with completely different jobs than me that I co-work with all the time. We just go to each other's houses and work in the same place and have a nice time together instead of being alone. Like if you're working from home anyways, work at your friend's home and then you have a co-worker. Highly recommend, really. The only thing on my five-year plan is never going back to an actual office and just working on my friend's couches. <laughs> Okay, this is a big one. In general, the way that graduate programs are set up gives professors a kinda unconscionable amount of power over their students. So it makes sense that mental health markers track with whether or not a student feels supported by their PI. For this reason, I'm gonna repeat what I said about collaborators. Though it doesn't seem like it when you're getting excited about the subject of your first research project, the relationship you have with your advisor is going to underscore your quality of life for the next one to eight years. Or more, some people do more. There was a guy in like the 80s who was a grad student at Stanford for like 18 years before showing up to campus with a list of names and a hammer. Can I say that he murdered his advisor? I'm not recommending that, I'm just showing it as an absolutely wild example of the extremes of this system. <laughs> I know how tempting it can be to set your sights on that one professor who does that one project that you just think is so cool. But consider, what's more important, being treated with a basic level of respect or getting to study black holes? I should have studied planets. All the solar system people I know are so nice. I could have been studying Jupiter. Look at it. It's great. But for real, my two cents? Prioritize the person who will treat you well. The best way to find out who will treat their students well is to ask other students. Ask them about their professor's communication styles, how they run their groups, what their previous students have gone on to do. Do your research, basically. Now unfortunately, sometimes you don't find someone who will both treat you well and pay you, in which case you might end up working for somebody who does not treat you well. In that case, you might want to try seeking mentorship elsewhere. By that, I mean that you can nominally be advised by one person in your department, but also seek professional support, advice, guidance from someone else. It can also mean reaching out to your networks, even people at other institutions, to find someone to do research with, maybe even to fund you, while you go to your actual advisor just for like advancement paperwork or whatever. And I know that that sounds like an absurd thing to do. The circumstances that would require that are absurd, but sometimes that's the best case scenario. I don't actually think it's a requirement of most grad programs that somebody in their department advise you. Like they can let you in and then just be like, figure it out. It's not our job to help you. What do you think we are, at school? Basically, get mentorship where you can find it. And I wanna quickly put a little asterisk on that point. If you are, whatever kind of underrepresented person, allyship and mentorship can be kind of complicated and I think understanding some of that complexity could help navigate it. This idea is really well encapsulated in an essay by theoretical cosmologist and scholar of gender studies Dr. Chanda Prescott Weinstein who speaks to this complexity in her own experiences with mentorship. I was willing to understand that the world isn't made of binaries. As I moved through the ranks of academia, I've not only had to continue believing this, but 
I have had to rely on this fact. There are terrible faculty out there, like the white people who treat minoritized students as a professional opportunity, but there are also the faculty who gave me shelter, who wrote me letters, and who made phone calls on my behalf. Sometimes they are complex. There's one very famous white male professor who has never looked me in the eye or spoken to me, even though we were in the same department for several years. He also quietly sent a note to hiring committees, telling them to choose me because he thought I was a brilliant thinker. I was willing to accept that people can be imperfect and still be a source of support. She is speaking to a really subtle point here where oftentimes people think allyship is like, yes, an ally or not an ally, when in reality, things tend to be more complicated and a lot of people lie in between. To give an example, there was a grad student I talked to in a study I conducted once who spoke of the cognitive dissonance in having a professor who was simultaneously, you know, very passionately and sincerely and impactfully advocating for students of color, but was openly transphobic. You can see how that might be difficult but necessary to navigate as, for example, a black trans person who doesn't have any other people in a space to advocate for them in their entirety. For a deeper dive into the complexity of interdependence in the presence of academic power dynamics, I highly recommend checking out the rest of that essay. There are tons of great essays on her Medium page, like this one that has more general, concrete advice on finding and setting expectations with mentors, and another really important one on recognizing abuse from a professor. Not physical abuse, but the emotional and psychological abuse that is sometimes employed to make students more exploitable. Seriously, just send that last one to anyone you know who's starting grad school. It's required reading. But my point is, when you look for mentors, maintain an open mind and a modicum of caution. Also, you can mentor someone. Remember, it's interdependence, not just dependence. If you have the time and energy, see if you can pay it forward. It's definitely a lot of work, but it can be really rewarding to see yourself actually contribute to another person's well-being. Try it sometime. It's a bit complicated whether or not graduate student workers are classified as employees. It depends on whether the university is public or private and what state it's in. And I'm also just assuming in American context, academic systems can actually be pretty different across countries and I can only really speak to what I know. But as universities are becoming increasingly corporatized, the classification legally of graduate student workers is becoming increasingly a matter of labor rights. Like, yes, graduate students are in a sense students, but they're also also producing research that makes money for the university. They carry more and more of universities' teaching loads, oftentimes teaching more than even tenured faculty do. And if you think that graduate student instructors are nothing but glorified babysitters killing time until the real professors come through, it actually turns out that undergrads are more likely to major in a subject if the first class they had in it was taught by a graduate student rather than a professor. So grad students do research that make their universities money, teach classes that save universities even more money, and get students invested in their education, in other words, creating more opportunities for universities to make money, while only tenuously being protected by federal labor laws. There is simply no getting around exploitation in this perfect storm of economic dependence and lack of regulation. So what do you do if your labor is being exploited? Solidarity forever! Support the UC strike! The answer is us! So I wanted to be cute and like shoot some of this video at the picket line and I tried doing that but it's just very easy to get caught up in all the emotions of it and I was excited and saying all sorts of inaccurate things so I wanted to do it right and came back to this little grove of eucalyptus trees on the campus of UC Berkeley. This is where I went to grad school and I know a lot of reactionaries get triggered by like the radical mythos of Berkeley but honestly I don't love this place either probably for different reasons. They think that Berkeley's all woke SJWs but I know that they're actually just really good at branding. We are not the same but this is that most prestigious of institutions from which I narrowly scraped by with my PhD and one of the last things in my legally unspecific but nonetheless unpleasant half decade here was to sign a union card so that graduate student researchers across the University of California system could join the United Auto Workers Union and they did and they started bargaining and the university obstructed and broke laws and now 48,000 academic workers across the state are participating 
in the biggest academic strike in U.S. history. At time of recording, we're three weeks into the strike, and I say we as if I'm technically a part of the strike. I'm not. I graduated. I don't work here anymore, but I've been coming to picket sometimes, and I just feel really invested also it's just been a great time like shout out to the organizers the vibes have been immaculate for three weeks now postdocs graders tas staff researchers and of course graduate student researchers have been withholding their labor from the university in order to bargain for better working conditions. For context, the University of California's system-wide investment assets last year totaled to $168 billion, and that was a $38 billion increase from the year before, meaning from 2020 to 2021, they made their record profits. Do you remember what happened to the rest of us that year? Apropos of nothing, 5% of students in the UC system are homeless. I saw this article that talked about the consequences of the strike that said something like, if they actually pay the striking workers fairly, then the university would have less money to conduct their transformative work on economic inequality. Side note, the list of supposed transformative work that would take a hit from fair wages in that article included galactic mysteries, and as someone who got a doctorate in astrophysics from this place, I am at a loss for why galactic mysteries is cited as something that we should care about in this context. For whatever like social or political reputation this institution likes to present, there is just no getting around the fact that as it makes more and more money off the labor of its lowest paid workers, rent prices rise, inflation grows, and the people holding this institution up can't afford to live where they work. So the union is trying to change that. Besides demanding wages that are actually in line with the cost of living, the strike is calling for more robust worker contracts that actually provide job security. For example, to prevent abusive professors from threatening the loss of pay to exploit grads. Some of the other demands include better child care benefits, policies to support disabled workers, improved public transit access, and protections for international students, documented or otherwise. At time of recording, the bargaining team has already secured anti-bullying and harassment protections, which is huge. I really just can't express how rampant and normal it is for professors to bully students, and not in like a cute fun way, but in a really seriously codependent and sometimes downright abusive way. And it's just kind of accepted as how academia works, so there's typically little to no recourse. So I'm just going to drop this article that describes how to recognize academic abuse again because it's very important. So this has already been a victory in my book. I mean, it's not the revolution, but it's something. At the very least, it's an example of the power of union organizing. And honestly, it's kind of weird to make this video because the strike is ongoing and I don't know if it's going to go on for months or it's going to finish by the time I get this posted or there are going to be huge wins or not so much. But right now, I'm just so excited. Maybe I'm caught up in a moment of that silly human thing where we ascribe more importance to patterns than is perhaps warranted and think there's like grand stories and causality when there isn't but I'm feeling such like electricity you know not just here China's been seeing the biggest protests in its history since Tiananmen Square women in Iran have started a goddamn revolution and we've all been watching Twitter and Elon Musk collapse in real time and so when I walk around this campus and I see people feeding each other and sitting in the grass stretching together and playing music and singing and dancing to entertain each other in the hours of picketing and just the crowds and crowds and crowds that come out in this beautiful expression of solidarity for people's fellow worker. It makes me feel like a lot more is possible than I maybe thought. Maybe this is the moment where all those things I was so mad about when I was still a student here change. I don't know that hopeful is even the right word necessarily to describe what it is that I'm feeling, but it's certainly cathartic. The other day in the picket line, somebody handed me a Vuvuzela and I spent that afternoon just tooting my little heart out at that building that I used to have heart palpitations walking up to every day. And it felt so great. It felt like the closure I never had as somebody who graduated when we were still in lockdown. And honestly, even if we hadn't been, probably wouldn't have wanted to celebrate here anyways. So yeah, maybe I'm getting lost in my main character story arc or just caught up in plain old revolutionary magical thinking. But there's a strike and I'm excited about it and I wanted to share that excitement with you because excitement for things like political organizing is 
really hard to come by these days. If the strike's still ongoing when you watch this, please consider donating to the Hardship Fund. I'll put a link for it in the description below. People don't get paid during striking, so loss of wages is a big problem. So this is to make sure nobody goes homeless or can't eat because they're participating in the strike. Some of it also goes to resources like food and water for the people who are doing a great job out here picketing every day and just really keeping up the energy and the vibe and the solidarity and it's I'm very proud of everyone like I'm not even upset that I don't benefit from this because I already left like I'm just happy this might be a thing for other people but if the strike is over if you're watching in the future whatever ends up happening I feel like the thing I can say for posterity with confidence is this it's the same thing I say to grad students who are thinking of dropping out or don't know what they're gonna do after they graduate and are scared no matter what happens next things can only get better than where they are now so join your union if grads at your school have already unionized sign up pay your dues get involved if they haven't unionized yet but they're working on it join the effort it may be kind of difficult because universities absolutely do try to deter students from unionizing so you might have to like meet off campus and other kind of clandestine things like that but look what it can do and if a strike is going on best not be crossing that picket line join the strike trust me it's a great time <laughs> Grad school is hard. Like I said at the beginning of this video, a lot of people kind of understand that, but somehow they hear the horror stories and believe that they'll be the exception. The one that actually doesn't need anybody's help to get through successfully and with a sense of self intact. And like I know I've been painting it out to be very negative, I am not here to inspire you, like I'm just trying to give people information to make well informed decisions. Like I just want to clearly communicate some of the harsher realities that we don't tend to talk about. I don't know, maybe some people don't have the worst time. Surely they exist. I don't know that I know them, but like, maybe? Maybe somewhere else. But I fixate on this hypothetical person who believes themselves to be the exception because I was that. And I was absolutely clotheslined by the realities of burnout and depression and what I can only describe as complete apathy from the system I had naively thought was invested in my education. And this feels really corny to say out loud on the internet, but I was only able to succeed because of the help of my friends and mentors. And when I say succeeded, I don't just mean graduating with a PhD, I mean leaving that experience in a physical, mental, emotional state where I was actually equipped to deal with a post-graduation world. I did not get to where I am today on the basis of my brilliance, creativity, or work ethic. At least not only because of those things, I am very brilliant and creative and work ethic. <laughs> I'm not work ethic. It's a different video though. I am where I am because people helped me and it gives me great satisfaction to know that to some extent there are people that are where they are because I helped them. After all the prestige and publications and bougie telescopes, the real treasure is the friends you made along the way. And organize for the love of God. You realize that's the solution to everything and not just grad school, right? Right? Right. <laughs> So if you were paying attention, you might have noticed that I said I was going to talk about seven kinds of relationships in this video, and so far I only talked about six. There is one more kind of bonus one, but first I wanted to take a moment to plug my Patreon. So the names that are scrolling by on the screen now are people who have signed up to send a couple dollars my way every month so that I can make stuff like this video and my other videos, which you should check out if you haven't yet, as well as the link to the UC Hardship Fund I talked about earlier. Otherwise, you know, do the algorithm thing, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, like, share with a friend, appreciate the seventh kind of relationship as kind of a postscript because it's not really a relationship with a person exactly it is your literal physical environment a lot of us academics are really transient right you go from institution to institution and i think in those circumstances it's easy to become very detached from where you live and have it just be kind of the place you're staying while you finish something but my relationship to the place i live was completely changed when i learned about something called bioregionalism from this book called how to do nothing resisting the attention economy 
Anahi by Bay Area artist Jenny O'Dell, which I really enjoyed. And it's basically a philosophy that counters alienation from place by trying to tell people to pay attention to where they are. Learning about the plants that are native to your area, being able to identify birds or other animals that live around you, eating locally grown foods are all examples of practicing bioregionalism. Having an awareness of the literal ecosystem that you, as a human, are a part of. And it sounds corny, this whole video has been really corny, but for me, kind of starting to pay attention to that kind of thing really did just change like my baseline perception of just like walking around my neighborhood and stuff. Like I had this ritual while I was writing my thesis where every day at exactly five o'clock, I would close my laptop and I would like take a little cup of hot water outside and pick some mint leaves or something and have a little tea just sitting in the dirt not doing anything and not listening to anything and not talking to anyone just sitting in silence but i never ended up actually being in silence you notice things you notice the birds and how that bird sounds different from this bird and then you notice the family of squirrels living in a tree and then you notice that some of your neighbors outside and you can hear them and it's like you know you're not really alone and on that note try to meet your neighbors you know, actually be a part of your neighborhood and your community. At the very least, participate in local elections. It doesn't take that much work to look up a voting guide that aligns with your values and put the minimum amount of effort in every couple of years to do your civic duty of participating in democracy. Like, say what you will about federal electoral politics, but you absolutely have the ability to change meaningful things on the scale of your city, county, or state. But I'm getting political, I'll stop. I'll bring it back. The point is, relationship number seven of how to survive grad school. Go touch grads. Oops, no.